Jose Marlos, and uh, I'm a project leader of South Elementary Education Program, IPA Federation Study. Well, this time, uh, Dr. Marites Young and Dr. Yang Yang Liu, uh, they will present uh, two uh, papers on basically on gender disparities in education and the labor market using our survey data. We're going to address uh, basically three questions. What is the gender gap in education and the labor market in the Philippines? This is a very large question. And how these two issues, the gap in education and the gap in the labor market, are interrelated? And what is the role of family institutions? Let me highlight uh, finding the two works. The first paper titled Why Women Are Progressive in Education. This paper uh, is focusing on interactions of school education and labor market and funding system. So there are three actors playing a different role in the, in the analysis. And they're closely related to produce or support female advantage in education. So female advantage is not just a phenomenon in the education system, but the labor market and family system are playing an important roles to produce a female advantage in education. In the second paper, being presented by Dr. Liu, titled uh, School Quality, Labor Market Imbalance, and Human Capital Investment, in this paper, we use the South Elementary Education uh, Program School Intervention as an experiment to <coughs> improve school quality. So we're going to look at the, the, uh, how we're going to quantify how the school improvement in the school quality is changing uh, the female advantage in education. And we found the long-term impacts of improvement of school quality after default by gender. It's a stronger, larger for females. In these two studies, uh, we use our recent survey data from eight provinces, and that covers 3,481 household students, and four provinces, out of eight provinces, actually keep intervention school division. And these provinces are distributed a bit like this. So let me switch to So let me introduce first our first paper presenter. Our uh, first paper presenter is a research fellow of the markets Trade and Institutions Division of IFP also. Uh, an agricultural economist by training, her research work focuses on food and water safety challenges along the value chain of high value products, as well as on smallholders' participation in crop and livestock markets, efficiency and productivity. Her research experience include social economic survey design and implementation, data management, and econometric analysis and project management in several countries in South and Southeast Asia and East and West Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, here to present on why females are progressive in education, please welcome Dr. Marites Choco. Thank you very much, Alex, for coming. Um, I'll, I'm honored to talk about why women are progressive in education, gender disparities, in human capital, labor markets, and family arrangements in the Philippines. Um, Dr. Futoshi has already given a synopsis of the findings of this study, of this paper, and I'm going to talk about it in detail. So for our motivation in this paper, why women in the Philippines are progressive in education and still there's they receive, females receive low, lower wages compared to men. And then, the, there, so there, is, there exists um, labor market discrimination against women. 
So um, there's a contradiction between progression in education and uh, disadvantage in labor market. So we will try to explain this in this paper in, in, as I go along in the talk. And um, by showing that investment in female education is an optimal response to labor discrimination, to labor market discrimination. And before I move on to that, let me just um, guide you so that we both understand the background behind education and labor markets. So um, we are using here the 2009, um, October 2009 Philippine Labor Force Survey. And um, as you can see, there's a gender gap between college completion between females and males. The proportion of females um, definitely they advance more in terms of college completion than males, especially um, at the cohorts, younger cohorts, younger age brackets. And um, looking more closely at the um, returns in schooling, we see that there's uh, females are disadvantaged. So there's a wage penalty in the labor market among females compared to males. Um, in all cohorts, you see that there's a negative effect of females on the daily wage. So we're using here a um, Mitzerian quadratic equation where we use um, age, age squared as our proxy for experience, and then the different cohorts of student with elementary, elementary completed as our um, educational attainment. And as you can see, as the, um, as the as education increases, you have higher returns of um, schooling. But then, when it comes to um, age and age squared, there's um, there's a positive effect, but then it's uh, uh, at a diminishing rate. And we're also using here regional dummies for to control for regional effects, regional fixed effects and observables. So based on the wage penalty that we see in the, at the national level, we are we have um, this following hypothesis that uh, females are motivated to study harder to attain more education. Um, we expect that this labor market discrimination can motivate women to attain higher levels of education in order to have um, comparable wage earnings. Um, with men. And we also hypothesize that males have advantage in labor market earnings, so which is um, not related to educational attainment, so education is less important for them. Um, another hypothesis is that um, in bilateral intergenerational support system, females play equal roles or greater roles than males to support their parents. Um, we know from our Filipino culture that um, we, our parents expect us to somehow pay or pay back what they have invested. And so um, that's uh, kind of uh, what we have um, as part of our insights here. That um, based on that, we think that this bilateral intergenerational support system um, women would, uh, uh, parents would depend more on females. And I will show later on uh, with the results. So if females share more of their incomes and time with parents, parents have a larger incentive to invest in daughter schooling, to have more returns to schooling. So this is consistent with our results later on, um, which I think Dr. Futoshi has already mentioned that um, in terms of family arrangements, there's tighter commitment between parents and daughters, which increases investment of parents to daughters' uh, education, and because they are more likely to give uh, su more support than their sons. On the other hand, the income share is smaller from sons, so we don't, as parents, we don't expect more from our sons than from our daughters. So therefore, parents would have a smaller incentive to invest in sons' play. Whether these are true or not, then let's see how what our data shows. Um, we uh, we try to model our insights um, 
by using this simple model where we have three key elements. Um, this one is the support, the support incentive um, or income share of the child. And this one is the labor earnings. And then um, this would be your labor discrimination alpha, which is your alpha. So all would depend on your discrimination in the labor market alpha. So as a child, um, I would as a child I would decide my income sharing decision would depend on the earnings in the labor market, beta S and alpha plus alpha. Your S here is your schooling investment. And then it also depends on the income share and also depends on uh, yeah, already there, so it's pulling investment. So, in the case of the parents' pay off function, we, that would also depend on the support that they will give to their child, and then the, which would, the, the support that they will give to their child would affect the labor earnings of their children. And in terms of the support function, um, this could be um, either zero or a value uh, of A bar, which is maximum. And it could be child care, co-residence that is living with parents, and then also like inheritance. Okay, based on this model, we have two solutions. One is the low investment equilibrium, where we have a work market advantage, where your alpha is greater than your um, AVAR and your inheritance and then your uh, less your schooling investment. And then another equilibrium would be high investment equilibrium where you have labor market disadvantage. That is when you have your alpha, uh, when your wage is slow for low skills, for low skill labor. Okay, to explain further, so we assume here that if income is already guaranteed, so regard the first one, low investment equilibrium, we are where you have labor market advantage. So if income is already guaranteed regardless of your educational attainment, so the schooling investment, your S here, would be low because it's already guaranteed. And then so and then your income share would then be zero. And so um, the child will have smaller incentive to invest or to share his income or her income to her parents. Under the high investment equilibrium, this is a case where you have your wage for low skill is low in the labor market is low. So meaning your alpha is small. And so in, this is important I mean the schooling investment here is important so you have a uh, high schooling investment from parents and the decision would be affected the parents decision to invest in their children would be affect, would affect the labor uh, market wage or earnings of their children later on um, in short we have uh, two equilibria we have the high investment equilibrium wherein parents invest in female schooling more so they expect the females share more income and time with their parents in short the returns are high for parents and then the second equilibrium would be low investment equilibrium where parents do not invest um, in male schooling and males do not share much income and time with parents so the parents would expect low returns from their or low low or zero share from their sons. Okay, um, we, we used the TUP survey, um, wait, because I was expecting to push you to explain. <laughs> anyway, so first I would like to acknowledge the presence of um, those who have been heavily involved in collecting the data that we use for this study. Um, the Miss Pega Scott and Violi Cordova who are here and they really um, spent all their time and uh, collecting data from these eight provinces. 
So um, actually, there are 23 provinces that have been under TEP or Third Elementary Education Program way back in 2000, way back in 2000 to 2006. <laughs> Um, these provinces, 23 provinces, were considered as the poorest among the poor um, divisions, school divisions. Um, and then, well, some of them are in the north, um, also here in the Visayas region, and some in the Mindanao region. So our sample, out of the 23 TEP provinces, we only have four. Um, four with TEP and then four non-TEP um, provinces. So the, the one with the asterisk are those with TEP um, or with the interventions. So that would be in the Visayas and Tike and our non-TEP would be Iloilo and um, we have Leyte and then our non-TEP um, samples are from Samar and then we have TEP schools in Negros Oriental, and uh, we also took samples from not TEP in Cebu. In the north, we have Ifugao as our TEP samples, and then Nueva Vizcaya as uh, our not TEP um, samples. Okay, the, the state the data was collected between July 2010 to April 2011 among 111 elementary schools and in total we had 3,481 households and which is basically 3,481 sample students also and um, from grade 6 school year 1999 this is the pre-intervention and then 2004-2005 and 2005-2006 these are during the TEP program in total we were able to have um, 19,787 siblings from these 3,481 households. Among the questions that were asked were income, household, characteristics, demographics, um, assets, uh, that's uh, current asset 2010 and 2000. And then we also asked about the schooling, work, uh, history, and family background. I'm going to discuss a bit on the siblings because that's what I use in this paper. So for the siblings, um, we asked about the age, how they started, their, um, what, what age they started their education, if they have pre, um, preschool or what do you call that, uh, kindergarten or um, nursery grades and if they attended public or private schools and then we also asked about their name of schools for education and then the age when they graduated from elementary high school and college and then if they attended postgraduate level education and from the income sharing arrangements we also asked about whether they share their income when they are living with their parents or whether they are away or um, giving remittances to their parents all this information about the siblings were collected from their parents or guardians and so we expect a large measurement error um, from job related information. We asked about the current job and their first job as well. But we would we expect that in terms of schooling information, there would be a small measurement error because parents would know um, about their educational about their siblings' educational attainment. Okay, so these are just examples of um, TEP schools in the north, and which look more beautiful and has more facilities compared to. Well, I don't have pictures of those non-TEP schools. Okay, so in terms of the samples, um, we have um, for different provinces the non-TEP and TEP. Um, uh, I won't be don't go into details, but if you look at it, so okay, um, which ones are TEP? That would be Ifugao, Antique, um, Leyte, and Negros Oriental. So you would notice that there's an over something of the 
TEP cohorts compared to non-TEP. Well, the reason for this is, of course, one is that they, the, the sample listings or the, the uh, there was a lack of records in terms of the students' listings. Um, we have to, not we, but Violi and Fe have to spend like a month to just collect the listings of the students from, for those students who graduated in 1999, 2000, 2004, 2005, and 2005, 2006. And so for cases where we couldn't find the students, we do some, some sample replacements. And also the schools where we didn't find the student listings, we also replace them with uh, other schools with the same characteristics. Okay, um, I'm just going to show you a summary of uh, some variables, statistics, uh, descriptive statistics of some variables that we're using in our estimations. Um, so we have age, the mean age of the siblings uh, were like 20 years old and it ranges, sorry, that's not, uh, well, zero means less than one year old and then up to 54 years old. So female were like 49% of the sample. Years of schooling, that's um, the mean average was, on average it's eight years, so that would be high school, which is secondary school. Haven't, haven't graduated um, uh, high school yet. The birth order is four with uh, one, meaning this one is like up to 15 siblings. So you, you can imagine how large some of the households are or families. And then TAP exposure years, which is calculated as uh, from 1994 up to, okay, no, from 2000 up to 2006. So if uh, a child or a sibling has been exposed or has started grade one in 2000, then he is exposed for six years. And if he graduated in 1994, then he hasn't been exposed. So that would be zero um, TEP exposure years. We estimated four equations, um, schooling equation, income equation, income share equation, and co-residence equations. Um, I'm going to discuss each one in a, in a little bit, but um, just want to um, explain that for the years of schooling completed, the dependent variable we used here is educational attainment as measured by the number of years of schooling completed. So we didn't assume any repetition. So if, for example, um, a child has, we assume that um, a child has finished grade six at that age, 12, 13 years old, and then finished high school at 16 or 15, 16 years old, and then started college at 16 or 17 years old, and so on. So the standard. And so we use as our sample age bracket for the schooling or educational attainment equation to be between 15 to 30 years old. And for college entry and college completion, we use 20 to 30 years old siblings. In terms of income equation, we use monthly earnings. Now, these are reported earnings from our um, parents or guardians. And at times when the siblings are around, they would give us their um, earnings or monthly earnings. And for income share, and we also um, constrain our age, um, sa our sample of siblings to between 15 to 30 years old, which is uh, the labor force. Um, members of the labor force. Um, income share equation, we use the our dependent variable, which is a dumb, um, proportion share of income share, uh, it's the same thing, proportion of income share of uh, children to their parents. We combine the income share for those living with their parents and those away or giving remittances. And for co-residence equation, this uh, our dependent variable here is a dummy variable whether they are living with their parents or not. And for both equations, um, we're using uh, our sample siblings between 15 to 30 years old. Okay, um, to, uh, to wipe out some of the household fixed effects and within sibling fixed um, effects or fixed and observables, we use uh, household fixed effects 
equation, um, estimation or regression, and uh, that we we wipe out for the household fixed effects, and we also use province fixed effects, um, province destination effects, and school fixed effects in our income equation, which I'm going to show you in a while. So um, these are just to wipe out the differences for the household fixed effects and individual and within siblings fixed uh, sibling estimation or fixed effects. We're trying to wipe out differences between siblings um, with inclusion of these household fixed effects. So um, in terms of this, it's the same uh, principle in terms of province fixed effects. We're trying to wipe out the unobservables um, provincial fixed effects unobservables that we cannot capture. Okay, let's um, first uh, look at the estimation results of our first equation, which is our educational attainment. And uh, as uh, what Dr. Fudoshi has mentioned earlier in his introduction, our results confirm that females among these their siblings tend to have advantage in terms of schooling. So in all years of so for these equations, you have the school fixed effects and household fixed effects. You see that females have, have positive effects on years of schooling. Also, in terms of college entry and college completion, with household fixed effects, um, females have advanced um, advantage in schooling. So within um, school fixed effects, the females are have positive effects. You see that in all cases also, whether you have school fixed effects or household fixed effects, your age is positive, but at a diminishing rate. And the mother's schooling is positive. Sibling size is negative for the first column. Birth order is positive, and then it turns negative, and negative for college entry and education. Um, with fixed effects, um, for fixed effects, the household fixed effects, and uh, that is with sibling variation, of, based on the inference of sibling variation, and even when we wipe out for this um, sibling, within sibling unobservables, we see that there's still a positive effect of female on years of schooling or educational attainment. So um, in the last two columns, the college entry and college completion, we see that females have an advantage of entering completion or entering college and also finishing college, which uh, is consistent with what we have observed in an earlier um, table that I showed you using the labor force survey, the national labor force survey. Okay, so um, for the second estimation, second equation, we have our dependent variables, monthly log of monthly earnings. We see that the the returns to schooling is positive in all uh, fixed effects. Um, so in here, we're just showing that for different fixed effects, like using original promises or school fixed effects and destination promises and household fixed effects. Our um, years of schooling or educational attainment is positive, um, has positive and significant effect to our monthly or to labor earnings. Um, what does the destination province mean? And uh, that's only where female is negative and the rest will be positive, but there's no significance. So um, the destination province is the current labor, uh, the current labor market that the sibling is working, wherever the sibling is working in that labor market. So we control here for the common fixed factors specific to that current labor market. Um, we can explain this why it's negative. The female effect is negative to labor earnings because um, it. Uh, Yeah, so this is where you see the penalty, the wage penalty, which is also reflected by the labor force survey that I showed you earlier. So it is highly likely, uh, just uh, to give you an 
insight of how we can explain this negative effect of females on labor earnings or returns to schooling. We, we see again uh, discrimination in wage here and so it's more likely that the females, given that we have a destination province as fixed effects or the local current labor markets, we see that there's highly likely, it's highly likely that these females tend to migrate out of their original provinces for better, um, to get better wages. And so returns to schooling are rather high. Uh, no, so returns to schooling are low within their original province. And then it could also be that on average, they will get lower wages, but then they will have, um, so it's still lower wage, right? So a disadvantage, even if they move to or migrate to other provinces where they have their, um, but then they would have an advantage in terms of, uh, no, wait, sorry, <laughs> let me go back. So <laughs> now that they have this, you have this negative effect on labor earnings, so that means your wage, the, the, the wages of females are lower compared to males and then this would be an incentive for them to study more or to attain higher education in order for them to attain higher earnings compared to men. That's it. Okay. Now for the third equation where we show the income sharing of the children or siblings to their parents. So we look at the female effect again and you see that uh, from our, based on our hypothesis, females share more of their income even if they um, receive lower wages, they still share more income to their parents. And, uh, the age is also, again positive at a decreasing rate, which uh, reflects the life stages of the, the siblings. So if you are still young, you tend to depend on your parents, so you stay with your parents. So in the end, you share more income to them because they, as females, they, the, the parents would um, invest more on their daughters and so they would expect that when they have higher um, education they would share more income to their parents so the incentive of parents to, be, to invest more on their daughters would depend on um, whether well is uh, triggered by the fact that there's wage uh, penalty and so females would tend to acquire more education so in the end, when they have more education, they would share more to their parents. So again, um, it uh, shows that for both school effects and household fixed effects, the female um, income share is high, is positive with the parents. Okay, and for the last equation, um, we're looking at more on family arrangements here, so it's uh, the co-residence equation. So the dependent variable here is whether the children or the sibling is living with their parents or not. As you can see, when we use school effects, the years of schooling was negative, and then when we use household fees effects, it turns out to be positive. And so why is this so? Um, because probably we are capturing in the school fixed effects, there's this unobserved um, endowment determining um, co-residence decision. But when you have uh, captured the household fixed effects, then you are sibling, then this, the siblings tend to live with their parents, which implies that the returns for schooling would be positive and then females also, the returns of females would also be, the share of females would also be high or positive. Um, for both equations with fixed, school fixed effects and household fixed effects, we 
we see that female again would uh, live with their parents. So there's an incentive, for a large incentive actually, it's uh, high, it's highly significant for for females or daughters to live with their parents. Um, females would tend to live with their parents and this would be uh, related to tighter commitments between daughters and parents. So this is consistent with what we have observed in our in earlier studies uh, related to bilateral family system where the daughters, even like for example married daughters, play a major role in taking care of their parents. So usually parents would stay with their daughters, married, even with married daughters. And so, um, well, because, yeah, their, their sons would also have their, the married sons would have their own families and then they would tend to also take care and support their in-laws and not their parents. So, um, for the case of AIDS, again, you will see a positive effect and diminishing effect showing again that for younger and unmarried females, they tend to reside with their parents because they're, they're probably because they're still studying or not working. And then um, later on when they get more education and have and get older and get married, um, they would tend to um, live with, away with their parents. But still the support would be higher in case of females than males. So uh, there's also our traditional norm that um, parents would also tend to live with their children, whether they're married, especially like for example with their married daughters, as I already mentioned earlier. And so um, the children would still expect, um, no, the parents would expect that they would be supported by their parents. And thus gaining more returns in terms of their schooling investment. So those are some of the implications with the results. Okay, to summarize our key findings, among the siblings, females tend to advance in schooling significantly more than males, as uh, was shown in equation, educational attainment equation, and females have advantage in entering or completing college education. However, the females receive lower wages, so this is where you have uh, labor market discrimination. But then this would, this is an incentive, a large incentive for females to educate themselves more, to attain higher education. As I said, to get more higher income compared to men. And uh, parents' investment in daughter's education would have large impacts on daughters' income than sons, which means that larger income shared from daughters as they become older or as they become educated. So this gives a high level of schooling investment on daughters from the parents, and at the same time, parents would expect that they would gain some higher income share from their, from their daughters. And then females are also likely to share more income and tend to live with their parents, which is opposite for males. So even if females have lower wages, they would still share more income with their parents. And more so, if they already attained higher education, they, then they would share more income with their parents. Um, some conclusions on the economic side. So because of wage penalty, females are more motivated to accumulate human capital. This is just a summary of what we, what I showed you. To earn higher wages comparable to men. And so females is pulling are higher and compared to men. And in terms of sociological aspects, the current situation that we found, we observed, reinforces or supports the bilateral family arrangements and their generational support family system. So female's role in the family is more important compared to that of males. I don't know if males here agree. And uh, especially if uh, the society would depend on non-agricultural activities. Thank you. So. Um,
for your questions, can you please reserve them um, so we can move on to Yang Yang's presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Chonko. Can we give Dr. Chonko a round of applause? So as uh, Dr. Chonko said, we will uh, reserve our questions for her presentation after Dr. Yang Yang's presentation. So our next speaker, as was already introduced, is also an IFPRI research fellow, also an economist by training. Her research interests include program impact evaluation, development economics, agricultural e insurance, microfinance, and productivity analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, here to present on school quality, labor market imbalance, and human capital in investment based on the evidence from the results of their study on the third elementary education project here in the Philippines. Please welcome Dr. Yayan Yu. Uh, this would uh, 
increase the opportunity cost of getting more education. So uh, the tip effect on educational attainment is ambiguous. We also expect the team can uh, team effect can be different by gender because it returns to schooling before by gender. Uh, this figure plots weight premiums of education for female and male based on the 2009 uh, labor force survey. Uh, here the, the blue bars are for females and the, the red bars are for males. Oh, those are too small. Thank you, for So this is some elementary and uh, elementary uh, school completed, some high school education and the high school completed, some college education, college completed and uh, postgraduate education. So you can see that the return function is steeper for female than for male. And uh, especially after high school, the weight premium is higher for females. Before high school, weight premium uh, of education is lower by female. So this can, uh, intuitively we can see that uh, uh, females have more incentive to get a college degree. I think that it's true in reality, at least in this classroom, I saw more females than males here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, as we can see later, this imbalance in the labor market can cause the tip effect to be different agenda. So this uh, discussion motivated our research questions. First, we want to know to what extent team can affect the students' schooling attainment, migration, and wage in the labor market. Second, we are interested in uh, whether TIP effect, TIP effect is different for male, for male students and uh, female students. The remainder of this presentation is as follows. First, I will present a model that characterizes the effects of improved uh, school quality on schooling investment and then talk about the data and the uh, empirical framework and uh, results. Uh, now the model. We consider a household consists of parents, a female child and a male child. We assume there are two periods, current and the future period. In current period, uh, child uh, human capital is good uh, have The future income of the child Y, oh, sorry, uh, y uh, depends on the human capital generated in the current period. And we also assume the return to human capital data is gender specific. So J index gender. Uh, human capital function Age, uh, human capital age is a function of student investment in schooling as uh, parents investment in schooling X and school quality. Uh, we assume F is increasing and concrete function. So uh, school quality and uh, parents investment in schooling are com complementary to student investment. Student investment in schooling refers to uh, the time allocated to study and the effort group to study. And uh, uh, parents' investment refers to, uh, for example, college tuition and um, high, uh, the private school tutoring, etc. It's reasonable to assume they are complementary because, for example, uh, getting a college degree requires the students to work hard and requires the parents to provide tuition. Uh, we assume the decision program has two stages. In the first stage, students uh, make decisions on optimal time allocation between work and study. Work can generate current income and study can form uh, can build up the capital, uh, human capital, uh, those happen in the current period. 
So the child's future income depends on the choice in the current period. Uh, if, if the child decided to work more and study less, he will earn more in current period, but he will earn less in the future because her uh, human capital will be lower. So it seems the child's um, objective function objective is to maximize the discounted sum of lifetime income. This term, the first term is the current income, and uh, this is future discounted future income. Uh, WK is the unskilled wage rate, so you will skill that. Uh, so T is the total time endowment of endowment of child which can be used for study and work. S is uh, the time allocated to study. So this is current income because you could uh, assume you student uh, work now, you can only get a lower unskilled wage, unskilled wage because the human capital is low. And that's the future income. Future income is a function of the current choice of time allocation as In the second stage, parents observe the decision of ch children and make their optimal decisions on uh, investment in schooling. We assume uh, for the parents, parents care about consumption and uh, the future income of children. Uh, it's, uh, the parents' objective function is the summation of utility function uh, based on consumption and uh, uh, the discounted future income of both children. So this Y is the summation of the uh, future income of the male child and the female child. Uh, this is just a budget constraint. C consumption P is the unit price of the uh, parent's investment X. And Y is the uh, income from parent current period. and. Uh, that is the summation of uh, uh, income from children. So the left-hand side is the total spending, and the right-hand side is the uh, total income. So we solve these two stage uh, decision problem using a backward convention, and uh, then we impose the two conditions in labor market. Uh, condition one, uh, the unskilled labor, unskilled wage is higher for female than for male. This is intuitive, reasonable intuitively because males are physically stronger than female generally. And uh, it is also observed by the literature. Condition two, uh, return, return to schooling is higher for females than for males. This is confirmed by our estimation using the labor force survey as presented earlier. Um, then this model gave us the following predictions. First, female child put more efforts than male child on schooling. And uh, Marisa has also got the same conclusion in their quick model. But this intuitively, uh, there are two reasons. Mm. First, because uh, females are more rewarded by getting higher education because of condition two, because of condition two, uh, the return to schooling is higher for female than male. And uh, also, the opportunity cost of female to get uh, more education is lower than male because of condition one, the unskilled wage is higher for male than for female. Uh, second, parents are likely to invest more in female child. Mm, this is because the parents' investment and the children's investment are complementary. So uh, parents are likely to invest on the child who work harder, which is the female child. The third one is uh, liquidity constraint is likely to be less binding for female child. Uh, if the liquidity constraint is not bending, 
both the parents do. The parents would, uh, would want the children to work more and study less. And between the female and male child, I think parents would prefer the male child to work more because of condition one. Uh, male, the male child can earn more in unskilled job market. So parents would uh, reduce the investment on the male child to discourage him to study. For example, the child can tell, uh, sorry, the parents can tell the child that uh, uh, they will not uh, support him in they would not give him tuition in college. Uh, in fact, financial reason is the top reason that the students drop out of high school in our sample. Uh, this model also predicts uh, female child's time input on schooling is more responsive to improvement in school quality and the parents' investment in female child is more responsible to this this passage, sorry, to improvement in school quality and still regret life. Oh, okay. So the prediction one and two suggests there is a female advantage in schooling attainment. And the uh, uh, predicted thought five implies that the female advantage will be enhanced by people, by improvement of school quality. So we have the following three testable uh, hypotheses. First, females have advantages in educational attainment. Second, we thought so quality enhances female advantages in educational attainment. And three, liquidity constraint is less binding for females. Our next task is to use our data to empirically test those hypotheses. Uh, about the data, Thank you, Maritz and uh, Futoshi. Uh, they have explained the data. And now I'm just uh, going to explain it from the impact evaluation uh, aspect. So data come from household survey and student tracking survey conducted in 2011. Uh, and our sample method is uh, like this. At first, we sampled four pairs of adjacent divisions, like uh, the same map showed by uh, Maritz. Here in each pair, one division is treatment division, the other is uh, is non treatment division, is control division. We sample in this way is to uh, make the control group and the uh, treatment group to be as comparable as possible. We expect the, the two divisions. In the, same, in the pair share similar uh, social and economic conditions because they are neighbors. In the second step, we randomly sample 15 schools for each intervention division and 10 schools from uh, control divisions. So in each school, we randomly, uh, the, the, finally in each school, we randomly Sample 15 students from the uh, school year 1999 to 2003 period, grade 6, and uh, 20 students all together from the uh, TIP period. So this results in uh, more than 3,000 students from 101 schools. So this table was by Maris. Here's a uh, highlighted divisions are uh, treatment divisions and uh, the highlighted cohorts is we call it team cohorts. And uh, those cohorts of students we call one cohorts because they, they uh, enrolled in grade six before the intervention. So this sample uh, gives, gives us uh, both Group, both TIP and non tip group in both treatment and control divisions. This data structure allows us to explore double differences to identify the impacts of TIP. Our outcome variables uh, come from student tracking survey, which provides information on uh, schooling and the work history of the students. 
So this table uh, some, uh, reports sample means of outcomes by gender and cohorts. Our outcome variables are years of schooling, number of repetitions in high school, college entry, migration, and the localism of the monthly salary. salary. So the first three are schooling outcomes. Migration and the wish are labor market outcomes. So those two colors for non people health, those two for people health, female, male, female, male. We can see female has, uh, look at non people health, we can see female has high, higher use of education than male, and uh, less reputation, has reputation than male, and uh, uh, higher rate of college entry than male. Uh, we, we can observe the same pattern in people of two. So that means uh, females outperform males in all of the three uh, schooling outcomes. On migration, we can see female is much higher, is much more likely to migrate than male too. Same here. And, uh, However, the wage of female is lower than male. And the uh, same here. Uh, the household survey provided information on household demographics and asset and income. We use those as control variables in our regressions later. Uh, now I talk about the empirical framework. Our identification strategy is double differences. Uh, that means uh, we compare uh, typical health with non-typical health in treatment areas and control areas. We estimate the schooling equations, uh, migration equations, and the wage equations separately. For schooling equation, we specify a model like this. The depending, dependent variables is the school outcome variables, uh, years of schooling, high school reputations, and uh, college entry. And the alpha S is the school phase effect. Uh, this 05, 06 is typical health, and uh, T is the uh, uh, interaction of typical health and the tip division. So here, this is female, and uh, we use uh, eyesight to proxy for liquidity constraint. We interact uh, female and uh, liquidity constraint with uh, different variables in order to fully capture the effect of the gender specific effect and uh, the effect of what they could constraint. Here our key our variable our, our, our primary of interest, particular interest is R, beta two and beta uh, six. Beta two is uh, estimates keep effect on male and the beta six estimates uh, the difference in tip effect between male and female. Beta 4 is uh, the effect of liquidity constraint, and uh, beta 7 is the estimated gender gap in the effect of liquidity constraint. Oh, I forgot to mention X is uh, a set of uh, other control variables, including age, mother's education, and eyesight value, etc. So migration equation, we take the same specification. Uh, the dependent variable is whether migrated or not at a certain time. Uh, the here, again, beta 2 captures team effect on males, and uh, beta 6 captures the gender gap in team effect. Which equation is specified like this, and the dependent variable is the logarithm of uh, monthly salary. Here is the years of schooling, and uh, so beta one is return to years of return to education for male because we also have interact we also interact year of schooling with female. Oh, where did, did that put it? Somewhere. Oh yeah, here. And uh, again, beta seven is TP, uh, TP effects on male, and the beta eight uh, is the difference in TP effect between male and females. 
So we recognize that the placement of PIB is not random because PIB intended to target the poorer provinces. If we omit, if we omitted some variables that jointly affecting uh, PIB placement and outcome, our estimation results would be biased. To deal with this problem, uh, we did two robust mix checks. The first one, we follow Woodbridge 2007 to estimate the selection function. And uh, the selection function, uh, the estimation gave us the estimated propensity scores of each school. We then uh, assign weight to the observations based on the estimated propensity score scores. So we basically run weighted these squares instead of OLS. The second robot, in the second robustness check, we trimmed off observations with extreme propensity scores besides applying the weights. I assure that the results given by the two robustness check is are very close to the results given by the original model, which gave us more confidence of our estimation. Uh, now let me talk about our results. So this is the result for schooling equations. Uh, the depend uh, those are the key explanatory variable and those are dependent variables of the three the three dependent variables are the three uh, schooling outcome uh, respectively. So look at TIP, the TIP is not significant for years of schooling and high school education and it's significant only marginally for college entry. Sorry, I forgot, forgot to mention that uh, one star is uh, significant at the 10% level, two stars means at the 5% level and three stars at 1% level. So we can and this effect is negative from a surprise. So you can say that from this, uh, people barely have any, in fact, any impact on males. A female is positive at a, a significant at 1% level for both years of schooling and uh, high school reputation. This is not surprising. It indicates the existence of female advantage consistent with our hypothesis one. Uh, this is just to say that the uh, female advantage didn't change by cohort. Uh, more interesting result is this, the female interaction term of female and team is significant in all of the three outcomes. For years of schooling, positive, for high school reputation, negative, and for college entry, entry again, positive. So this means team enhance the female, uh, the existing female advantage. So this you can see supporting our, supporting our uh, second hypothesis. Uh, liquidity constraint, this uh, asset is significant in uh, this equation, years of schooling and uh, college entry. This is consistent with our expectation that uh, uh, liquidity constraint play an uh, important role in uh, schooling attainment. So, and uh, the interaction of female and uh, asset is significant for years of schooling and high school reputation. And this is uh, negative, that is positive, which indicates that uh, liquidity constraint is less binding for females in those two equations. So this is support of hypothesis three. Uh, in the migration uh, migration equation, the dependent variable is migration. So T different from what we learned in the schooling equation, T is significant. This means uh, T has a positive effect on mobility of males. So this is probably called due to the fact that the TIP uh, improves the general ability of both male and female students, so that improves uh, females' mobility. So females are easier to get a good job, males, sorry, to get a good job in cities. 
A female significant is not surprising consistent with our uh, summary statistics. Here again, females uh, time tip uh, is significant and positive, which means tip also increases mobility of males, it increases mobility of females even more. And the tip uh, times eyesight is positive, oh, sorry, is negative and significant. This just means, uh, this means tip empowers the poor. And uh, female uh, types eyesight is negative and significant, suggesting that uh, poor females are likely to migrate. This is also reasonable because of the opportunity of the poor uh, the opportunity cost of migration for the poor is lower. And uh, uh, finally, we talk about our wage equation and uh, the dependent variable is longer than our wage. And uh, uh, year of schooling, positive, not surprising, and the uh, age has a progressive form visible. And we have. Uh, Interestingly, we again, all oh, tip is not significant again this time, although it's positive. So, which means tip didn't uh, directly affect uh, male's wage have any impact on that. And interestingly, we find female time tip is positive and significant again. So, this means tip and only increased, only have positive impact on female. Notice that the female alone is negative. That means females are, have this advantage initially in the job market. So this result suggests that team actually narrows the gap, the uh, gender gap in the uh, in job market. And uh, here female alone is uh, female times your schooling positive, which means the returns of female, returns of schooling is higher for female. And uh, this result is consistent with our uh, assumption, our uh, job market uh, condition too. So that's the major result of this equation. Let me summarize our uh, main result. We found that an improved school quality by TIP enhanced the female advantage on subsequent school investment. And second, we found an improved school quality by TIP increased female migration and uh, labor market earnings. And third, liquidity constraint is less binding for females in educational attainment. So uh, am I to understand Dr. Liu and Dr. Choko that yet again we have empirical evidence saying that females are superior than males? <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, Dr. Choko. So now we have, uh, we can open the floor to uh, questions that are not jokes. So please use the microphones around the room, introduce yourself and your organization or the, uh, the agency that you're from. And uh, can you please keep our questions straight to the point? Thank you. Our mics are not working. Hello. Hello, I'm Wilbert Nira. I'm a graduate of chemical engineering in this university and I work for a supplemental education program last year. So my question is, seeing that gap between uh, genders, the education of male and female, what can you recommend to the Department of Education so that we can bridge that gap? Uh, who are you uh, asking? Um, Anyone? Dr. Fatoshi, they want Dr. Fatoshi to answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Fatoshi, can I?
this is a challenging question. Uh, you can hear me. What to be recommended to the Department of Education? Actually, the next week, we have a policy seminar or workshop inviting uh, superintendents from TPROP divisions and uh, TIP, former TIP leaders and some uh, deputy officials and undersecretary Dr. Kihano. Uh, we have a, uh, a dissemination workshop next week. And we're going to discuss some of the issues, including what we recommended to, uh, to narrow gender gap. But in my understanding, or in, probably we share the same understanding in our team, that probably DepEd has underinvested in understanding this issue for a long time. So they have to spend more time, or they have to spend more resources to understand the male's behavior compared to female's behavior. As you know, the many of our teachers in elementary school and also the high schools are females. And we actually don't know what is going on in the school education. So they really need to spend more time to understand the student's behavior in school and out of school. So that's going to is something we have to discuss it next week. Anybody? Yes, Dr. Gabis? Um, do, do I understand right that your findings uh, confirm, because I heard it as a hypothesis, that parents are likely to invest more in the female child that is empirically um, supported? Um, yes, it's based on the assumption an assumption that um, daughters would be um, attaining, would tend to attain more or achieve more education. This is in the Philippines. Yeah, in the Philippines. How does that, that your data compare with UNICEF data, for example? Because UNICEF has a program also that encourages you know, education for girls. Well, globally, I think uh, girls are less given opportunity for education. But of course, that is Philippine data. So how does your data compare with UNICEF data for the Philippines? Um, I think um, we already looked at that and it's consistent with what our um, with our results um, in terms of the females having given more share, having um, attaining more education than made than they have advanced um, in it. They are more advanced in terms of education than males. Um, and then, well, there are some studies, like for example, in the case of Futoshi, which Dr. Futoshi, which he did some time back, where there's a, he showed some complexity in terms of earnings. But um, other than that, but they really have consistent. We we found consistent findings. Um, Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I still have, okay, let's give the other chance. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I'm Amanda Bello from the Department of Economics here. I'm just reminded by uh, an earlier work by, I think, Otsuka, Estudillo, and Isabel, which also arrived at the same conclusion that parents invest more on the education of the female children. But the purpose of the study was different. Uh, they wanted to look, look at if the decision of parents to invest more on education for female and then bequeath the land to the male, to the male children would be in the long run equal. I think they arrived at the conclusion that the decision, uh, that, that decision uh, gave returns that are equal in the long term. I don't know if we can use that as an argument also why females have to study harder or it's because they know that at, at least in the rural setup the parents bequeath the land to the male because when they when the female marry they move out and so if the parents would like to keep the land within the family they would give it to the male male children and maybe that could be also a reason why the female 
uh, uh, the female children would have to study harder. Although I don't know if your data set would be, would be, but it's both rural and urban, right? So you would have children that are uh, 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 children of farmers. Um, our data are also coming from the rural areas, the very poor areas. And data that was used by Otsuka and uh, Estudillo and Kesame, they used the farm. Um, uh, I think it was the group survey. So it's more of farm. Rice farmers. Yeah, rice, rice farmers. farmers so, because uh, Pioli was involved in that survey also. So yes, you are right that um, in terms of um, support for education, they, they support education. They give um, higher investment to educating women or their daughters compared to males because for males, they give inheritance. So it's actually um, illustrated in our um, model, the Nash Equilibria, where we have work if, par if uh, parents would give more support um, to their children if they get more, um, if they gain more um, income. So in the case of males, since they already gave inheritance, it's like given. So the income is already given, so it's like low investment for them. Um, what, what our survey is missing is uh, detailed data on the inheritance. So if we have a more detailed data on the inheritance, like a land inheritance to some, uh, probably we may reach a quite similar conclusion. But theoretically speaking, uh, our conjecture is a bit different from uh, uh, Otsuka hypothesis in that uh, parents are quite selfish in our model. Pa parents are selfish in the sense that uh, they try to gain from investment in children, whether lung or schooling. So that, but then, okay, their hypothesis basically based on the egalitarian behavior by parents. So that is a good, quite critical difference between Otka hypothesis and our hypothesis. Given the uh, bilateral intergenerational support system in the Philippine exercise in the Philippines or many parts in the Southeast Asia, parents actually don't know who is going to take care of them at the later stage. Sons and the daughters are going to play the, almost the same role. Or daughters are playing a little bit greater role than sons. So from the parents' side, it is optimal for parents to invest equally in children because they don't know ex ante who is going to take care of parents. So we can explain what the hypothesis from rational behavior too. We don't have to depend on egalitarian motif. Okay, so are there any more questions from our audience? The one in the back? Yes, ma'am? Could you please use a microphone over there? To your right. Um, I'm a stream post. I'm a sophomore student. Um, I'm just wondering, my question is just simple. If, um, if the wills would outgrow for the boys, what would happen to the males? in terms of education and in terms of the economic status, what would happen to them? We can yes. answer. Uh, can you repeat the question? Um, if, um, if the females would outperform the, um, the males, um, what would happen to the males in terms of education and in their economic status? Okay, who would like to answer? If the females outperform the males, what would happen to the males, basically? What will happen to them? Will they just what? Well, from the, from the labor, national labor survey, males are already um, receiving higher wages compared to females. So what we're trying to do is uh, narrow the gap for females to also somehow um, be in you know, a par with women, with men, because um, they're already 
I had like Satoshi is already senior research fellow. I'm just like, <laughs> so I have to study more so that I can compete with him. No. <laughs> Okay, so, um, uh, okay, one last question. We have time for one last question. Ma'am, at the back. Uh, can you cite studies regarding uh, the disparity in terms of um, giving more incentive to males for, for uh, the first, uh, giving the first priority of giving them the higher income or wage or salary than the female counterpart. Dr. Fatoshi, Dr. Choka, Dr. Yu, you would like to answer? Yes, sir. Are there studies that uh, yes. we should tell us? Uh, the main reason why there is great disparity in terms of uh, preferring uh, the, the, the females, in terms of giving them higher salaries than the males. Why is there such um, a disparity uh, in life? Uh, in the Philippine setting? Isn't that what, um, well, there's um, another paper that Fotoshi is um, or has already written, which answers the labor market disparities and then trying to um, understand why uh, there, there is such a gap. And also, there are some studies at PIDS, PIDS, um, um, also explaining those. But those studies at PIDS are more of like um, review of literature and um, based on national labor foods, labor surveys, and the APs and uh, expenditure surveys. So they haven't really done something like what we did, which is very unique in terms of data collection, which is really at household level, and then looking at the sibling relationship between and the gender gap between these segments. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all the time that we have for You're questions. Right. If you have uh, any more questions, could you please uh, go to our speakers later after our program? So I think.